When Ford unveiled its F-150 Lightning electric pickup truck last week, there was a lot of criticism of the company floating around on social media. Questions were raised about battery supplies, vehicle production goals, and prices of mid and high range variants of Ford's first all electric pickup. Critics felt that Ford had been overly vague about its plans, and some alleged on sites like Twitter and Facebook that Ford was simply making a compliance truck that it never intended to sell in large volumes. Since that reveal event, which I'll admit was a little light on certain information, Ford has filled in the blanks, including details of its F-150 Lightning Pro variants, which are designed exclusively for commercial work use. During a media briefing earlier this week, we were told that Ford will offer a bare-bones, no-frills version of the 230-mile F-150 Lightning Pro from $39,974, US complete with a ruggedized interior, think easily cleaned vinyl seats, power frunk, and pro power for running tools off. It will also offer the 300-mile extended range battery pack Lightning Pro for $49,974, again, before incentives and fees. We were told Ford easily hit its EPA target range while hauling 1,000 pounds of load, and that range should be achievable with even more on board. We were also told that both versions of the Lightning Pro will come with Ford's 80 amp, two-way power capable Pro charging station included. That's the one that can run your home if there's a power cut. That answered some of the questions we've seen in the comments section, but yesterday, Ford held its Capital Markets Day, the equivalent of Tesla's Investor Day presentations and Volkswagen's Power Day. It not only made some big headlines of its own, but also laid down some of Ford's strategies moving forwards, both with the F-150 Lightning and Mustang Mach-E, but also with regards to future electric vehicles. Today, I'm going to look at what we learned, detail some of Ford's master plan for the company, and look at any holes that still remain. First, a reminder and a disclaimer to quiet some of our critics on this channel of late. Nobody who works on this channel has any direct investment in or financial relationship to any automaker. We do not make or accept any paid endorsements from companies we cover, and we do not and have not ever accepted paid editorials or advertorials. We retain 100% editorial control and the responsibility for the content we produce, and when someone on our team privately owns a vehicle or has a deposit on a vehicle we are covering, we state that clearly. Which brings me to today's video disclaimer. In the case of the Ford F-150 Lightning, myself and my wife had jointly placed down a $100 deposit on an F-150 Lightning. We intend to buy it and use it as both a work truck for this business, hauling camera gear and equipment, as well as using as a personal vehicle. With that out of the way, let's go to Ford's Capital Markets Day and the headlines that Ford made. First, Ford CEO Jim Farley claimed early in the 90-minute presentation that by 2030, 40% of all Ford's vehicles will be 100% electric, up from what he stated was, quote, low single digits today. Backed by a commitment to invest 30 billion US dollars in electric vehicles and battery development by 2025, that goal was later expanded in the presentation by Ford execs, stating that they believed one third of all full-size pickups globally would be electric by 2030, the equivalent of 800,000 vehicles annually for Ford, and that 70% of full-size bus and van sales from the brand would be electric by the same date. The other big headline grabber most outlets have reported was confirmation that Ford has developed what it calls the all-wheel drive, rear-wheel drive BEV flexible architecture, a platform that it says will underpin a new range of electric vehicles, including an active lifestyle model, cargo vehicles, mid-sized pickup trucks, adventure SUVs, think electric Bronco, and both Lincoln Aviator and Explorer models with both two and three rows of seats. More electric vehicles is great news, and it certainly seems that more choice from Ford in terms of electric models should help turn more of Ford's existing customer base into EV drivers, as well as of course help Ford capture Conquest purchases, something Ford says accounts for 70% of all Mustang Mark E purchases. But as many of you wanted to know in your comments to our coverage of the F-150 Lightning, there's still some really big questions surrounding Ford's commitments, supply chains, and more. So let's dig down 
Ford, like Tesla and Volkswagen, was keen to point out that it believes the future of electric vehicle development is centred around the battery packs that those vehicles have inside them. To that end, it reiterated the work of its existing team of battery experts, more than 150 employees currently, and the new Ford Ion Park, where much of its battery cell research will be based. Working on its own in-house research, as well as investing in new electric vehicle battery startups, Ford says it's developed a range of different battery cell chemistries for use in its vehicles. For high-performance vehicles that need either huge amounts of power for acceleration, load carrying or longer range, Ford says it will be using what it calls its Ion Boost pouch cell. They're lithium-ion cells designed by Ford but produced by several different battery partners. I think SK Innovation and LG Energy as far as I can tell. And the cell is more expensive than some other options but is happy to work with high power delivery and charging. But for commercial vehicles, where performance is less important and range is more predictable, but a full discharge is more likely every day, Ford says it's developed a lithium iron phosphate cell it calls Ion Boost Pro. These battery cells are far cheaper to make and offer longer life, meaning that commercial vehicle pricing won't be prohibitively expensive and maintenance costs will be kept low. At this point, of course, I should remind you that this is similar to Tesla's battery pack options. Tesla uses cobalt-free lithium-ion phosphate in some of its lower-end Model 3s made in China for pretty much the same reasons given by Ford. The fact that Ford is following Tesla's lead here should be reassuring to those who are worried about how serious Ford is. But perhaps the most interesting battery piece of news was the brief discussion of solid-state battery technology. Ford has been working on its own solid-state research and development and has also invested heavily in solid power, a startup that uses a sulfide-based solid-state electrolyte and a silicon-based anode in its batteries. And says Ford also uses a very similar production process to make its cells to existing lithium-ion cell production tech. This, Ford says, gives it a major advantage over other solid-state technologies, many of which have dramatically different manufacturing processes. For a company investing in electric vehicles, the ability to transition from lithium-ion production to solid-state production with as little extra expense as possible is key. In the case of solid power, Ford claims 70% of its capital expenditures into battery production can be reused for making solid power's solid-state cells. Regarding cell costs, Ford predicts economies of scale from ramping up its battery production. 240 gigawatt hours is estimated by the end of this decade, split between 140 gigawatt hours of cell production in North America and the rest in Europe and China, means that it expects to execute a 40% cost in reduction in cells by mid-decade. This translates to a $100 per kilowatt hour at the cell level by 2025 and $80 per kilowatt hour at the cell level by the end of the decade. Those who know about EVs should know that's an ambitious, if not impossible, goal to set. Last year, Bloomberg New Energy Finance reported that large format electric bus batteries in China have now dipped below that magic $100 per kilowatt hour price point, although it also noted that the average price was about $137 per kilowatt hour. Next, let's look at Ford's other manufacturing promises. While I didn't hear Ford discuss actual production volumes for the F-150 in its first year, it did reiterate its Q1 sales for the Mustang Mark E, which I should note were actually just two months of sales, as Ford didn't actually deliver any Mustang Mark E's in January. It suggested a similar rollout was on the cards for the F-150 Lightning, implying that it had economies of scale to roll out vehicles far more quickly than some competitors. And at this point, let's have a side note discussion. I know some people have criticised us and other outlets for being positive about Ford's Q1 delivery figures for the Mark E, 6,614 cars, noting that it's a drop in the ocean compared to, say, Tesla's current quarterly production figures. But the important thing here is that Ford has just started producing the Mark E, and during its first few quarters of production for Model 3, a car which then was just like the Mark E, built on a brand new platform, Tesla produced far fewer Model 3s than Ford did Mark E's in the same time frame. So back to the presentation. Ford believes its key advantage over smaller companies in its push to market actually lies in its production volume and expertise. It cited the decision two months into Mustang Mark E to increase production by 70%, noting that it had the relationships and, I'm paraphrasing, purchasing clout with part suppliers to make it easier to expand volume. 
It also noted that some of the suppliers it needs for electric vehicle components are already in established relationships with Ford. One example cited was the manufacturers who produce coatings, cathode coatings. Ford said it's the same companies that are already in established relationships with Ford. It uses those same coating materials in different applications inside an internal combustion engine vehicle. In another example, Ford says it was easier for it to order parts for a vehicle that would be produced in the millions during its lifetime, rather than a few hundred thousand that many startups produce. And it noted, even if it's only estimating 40% of its fleet will be electric by 2030, a figure I would personally rather see at 70 or 80% or more, it can use shared parts between its various vehicles to dramatically reduce parts complexity and cost. In a similar way, Ford believes it can leverage its existing relationships, and has already, with tier one part suppliers to design hardware and software in-house, then have those existing part suppliers manufacture its new components. That, it noted, is highlighted by the telematic suite it's been deploying across its vehicles in the last year or so. It says in just over a year, it will have more telematics capable and over-the-air updatable cars than Tesla and aims to have 33 million over-the-air updatable telematics-enabled cars by 2038. The only thing that we're unsure of? Ford's short-term production goals. Jim Farley has already stated that initial years of production for F-150 Lightning will be limited. We don't know how limited yet, with full-scale ramp-up occurring in 2023. I'm not going to lie, this disappoints me, but it's not exactly unexpected. It's fairly common to see automakers keep initial year production low for new models, especially electric vehicles. Traditionally, volume production doesn't start until the second year of a new vehicle's run, as it allows for the automaker to identify and resolve initial teething problems, refine the production process, and figure out which models and variants are more popular than others. For Ford, though, there's another good reason. Its Blue Oval SK production facilities a joint partnership between it and SK Innovation, are unlikely to be finished by the start of F-150 Lightning production next year. As to how many batteries Ford has secured, though? Well, I guess we'll have to wait and find out. But remember, Ford makes a really huge number of F-150s. And that's it for today. Please do hit subscribe and the bell if you haven't, as it stops YouTube from doing weird things with our content. And make sure that you have subscribed to Take Two and Transport Evolved Shorts. There are links below. Thanks on behalf of the entire TE crew, go out to the folks on my right for being our $15 to $49 a month Patreon supporters. Special thanks to our $50 a month patrons, that's Guido Drahota, Bronfi Wolf, Anonymous Freak, Regine Fellows, Kyle Hodgson, Gordon C, Paul Conway, Laura Sanborn, Anthony Coates, Denny Hyde, Sean Ueda and Tesla in the Gong. And our deepest gratitude to our $100 a month Patreon supporters, John Lyons, Marcel Ward, Reggie Watts, JP Fagerback, Will Graylin, and Ian. If you would like to join the ranks of wonderful supporters, you'll find links below to Patreon, Bitcoin, and Ko-fi. You can chat with the team and TE fans over at Discord. And if you would like to buy some TE swag, head over to our Redbubble store. We have some great new Pride-specific charity stuff just going live. Thanks for joining me. And as always, keep evolving. <laughs> <laughs>